Hello everybody, welcome back to another video. Uh, in this video we're going to be uh, reading from Romans chapter 10. Um, there's no title on this one actually, but Romans chapter 10, so let's begin. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I will testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, they did not submit to the righteousness of God. Christ is the end of the law unto righteousness for everyone who believes. So Paul here praying for his people, for Israel, is uh, speaking about them having a zeal. Okay, they were zealous. Paul the Apostle was zealous for the commandments of God. He was the Pharisee of the Pharisees. There was no, um, he wasn't a hypocrite. He was very, I'm going to get this right. I'm going to do right by God and I'm going to keep every single letter of the law. Okay, I'm going to make sure I hit it 100. And that was his, that was his attitude, that was his passion. And in, in, in a way, that was, that was a good thing. But as we see here, they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, they did not submit to the righteousness of God. Again, as we see, the theme is very occurring, and we see here again, as mentioned in earlier chapters, that they were trying to pursue righteousness by keeping the law, rather than by faith. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is based on the law. The man who does those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is based on faith says, Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven. Or who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the deep? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. Or what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. This is the word of faith that we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be ashamed. For there is no distinction or difference between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all his gen over all is generous towards all who call upon him. For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And this is, this is uh, one of my favourite verses as well, because we see here that we, we're all aware of the sinner's prayer, yeah? Now, we need, also need to be aware that the prayer in itself does not save a person. Okay, salvation isn't like a one prayer and it's done. You're saved. That is the beginning of your journey. It's like a marriage. When you go to the, vow, you go to the wedding, you say, I do, I do, and I'm going to love my, part, my husband, wife, etc. Um, and I'm going to stick with it, okay? I'm going to stay with it, I'm going to honour that decision. Um, yeah, you're technically married, but with a version, with a comparing to Christianity, your salvation's ongoing. Those who endure unto the end shall be saved. Okay, so we're saved, but we need to keep walking in our salvation with fear and trembling, working it out with fear and trembling, as it says in another place. Okay, so the prayer of salvation is the beginning. Now, the prayer of salvation normally is based on that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus or if you say Jesus Christ is my Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead you shall be saved for with the mouth confession is made unto salvation and with the heart man believe unto righteousness the other way around actually so it's essential that a person when they pray the prayer of salvation is they believe in their heart and then you will see the works come through it there so the prayer of salvation is scriptural because it's based on based on Bible, okay? But it isn't a one once you say you're saved and that's the end of it. Uh, I know when I first got saved, there was a lot of uh, this business in the in the church where people say, "Oh, I led a uh, hundred people to the Lord today," and you really had what, what was that then? When did that happen? Well, I prayed with a hundred people, and they all said the sinner's prayer, so a hundred people got saved. Well, that's not really true. A hundred people said the prayer of salvation. Doesn't mean a hundred people were saved. I would like to check up on them people in about six months' time and see how many actually stayed with God. We hear Billy Graham in his, in his big crusades, um, where up to 73,000 people got saved in one meeting. 5% um, 
six months later, five percent of those who said prayer salvation were continuing with God. Uh, D.L. Moody was one of the uh, the biggest uh, had the biggest success in his, his campaigns, and anywhere up to fifty percent of his converts stayed uh, with Christ. Fifty percent. Uh, Charles uh, Charles G. Finney, the revivalist of the uh, late 1700s, early 1800s, his uh, conversion ratio was 80%, and 80% of his converts stayed safe. But he, when he led people to Christ, he was discipling them intensely. He would follow them up, he would teach them and train them. He didn't just go to a place, say the prayer of salvation with 100 people, and then go away and leave them to it. He would then teach them and establish them and make sure they knew in no uncertain terms what salvation required. And that is why his uh, conversion rate was the highest in history since the days of the apostles. So, leading someone to Christ, that's not the end of it. You've got to follow them up. If you've led someone to the Lord and you've prayed with them for the prayer of salvation, it's now down to you to make sure they get the follow-up. Okay. Don't just leave them wandering around. Don't just go to church and pray with a person and go home and rejoice that one, you know, a person saved and the angels are rejoicing and then have nothing to do with them anymore. If you don't feel that you're able to disciple them or to follow them up, then find someone immediately who will do that. But really, in all fairness, if you lead someone to Christ, you should at least begin to get them started on their walk and then hand them over to the pastor or perhaps a support team in the church. Okay, so we're down to verse 13. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace who bring good news of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed your, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, indeed. Their voice went into all the earth, and their, world, their words to the ends of the world. But I say, did Israel not know? First Moses says, I will make you jealous by those who are not a nation, talking about the Gentiles, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. And Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I revealed myself to those who did not ask after me. But to Israel, he says, all day long I've stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. See, one of the, uh, one of the sort of uh, reasons why God reached out to the Gentiles and brought them into the covenant was to stir up Israel to jealousy, to make them think, Hang on a minute, I thought God was exclusive to the Jews. I thought he was our God, but well, he is. But he's the God of anyone who puts their faith in him. And we see that even in the, in the Old Testament, people like Rahab, she got saved. Okay, she wasn't a Jew. She, was, um, she didn't even have a covenant with God. She wasn't even following God. But through her acts of righteousness and faith, she got saved. Now, I think she wasn't a Jew. Correct me if I'm wrong. Just saying that off the top of my head. But she definitely didn't have a covenant with God. She was not following God. Because she was in a, in a city, you know, Jericho, where they were not, obviously, friendly with God. So, some, something around that area. And so, God uses the Gentiles to provoke the Jews by uh, the Jews going, That's, this isn't right. These people who don't even have a, who don't even have the real God, God is blessing them. God is in their life. He's doing things for them. He's answering their prayers. What, what, and so it should stir them up. And so that's what it does. How should I hear without a preacher? We hear so often people say, "I'm not called to be an evangelist." That's it. Then they don't bother telling anyone about God at all. No, that's an evangelist's job, that's the ministry of the evangelist, not called to be an evangelist. No, but the difference between an evangelist and just sharing your faith is a big difference. An evangelist is a person who's called specifically to reach people um, 
not only in large numbers, because we see Philip the Evangelist in Acts, he holds his campaigns, his crusades, miracles and signs and wonders are done, and then some people sort of like, oh, right, yeah, that's what an evangelist does, and they hold big meetings. But then one of the other times we hear of Philip is that he's doing a one-on-one -on -one witnessing session with the Ethiopian eunuch in the chariot. He doesn't only focus on evangelizing on mass, but also individually as well. A person who's an evangelist will have this burning desire in them that they can't not tell people about God. Now, that's what's in my heart. I have that burning desire to, to lead people to Christ. But o over the years I've matured more and, and become less, in some ways, confrontational. Some ways less irritating and, uh, and maybe a little forceful. Okay, Because in my zeal, I did sort of think, this, I, I need to get this person saved. You know, or if that something happens, they'll go to hell. I need to, I need to talk to them until they get saved. <clears throat> and sometimes I was overbearing. Time and time and experience and maturity and um, <laughs> learning body language in my case also. Because I'm autistic, autistics uh, people do not tend to be able to read body language or facial expressions and respond to them correctly, okay? They just don't, they don't like eye contact with people for one thing, okay? So as autistic people, we're a bit uh, <clears throat> clueless sometimes to body language and to people's facial expressions. Not all, not all autistics, okay? But it's a, it's a general thing. And so I had to learn from books how to read people's body language and facial expressions so that when I'm talking to someone about the Lord, I can tell they're looking at the watch, if their feet are in a certain position, if how much eye blocking they're doing if I'm, if I'm overdoing it with the sharing of the gospel, okay? So how will anyone hear about a preacher? The evangelist has that intense desire. They will seek every opportunity to share, share the gospel. Um, for those who are not called to be an evangelist, we can also uh, reach people through our shining in our light. Sometimes not even with always with words, but in our lifestyle. Number one should be our lifestyle. I think it was uh, Charles Spurgeon that once said, uh, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. Okay? Now, he wasn't saying don't talk to people. It's not a cop-out. It's not an and or. It's let your lifestyle preach the gospel to people and then give words. Get to know people, build a rapport with them, and then you may find that they will bring the subject up and then you can have that opportunity to speak to them that way rather than just sort of barging in and saying this, that, and the other. Okay? Because we're dealing with people's hearts. Remember, we're dealing with people's hearts with evangelism and we need to make sure that we're gentle, kind, respectful um, when we're dealing with people. If they disagree with us about the gospel, we need to be kind and respectful and, and save it for another day. You know? Just sort of think. This isn't... Be sensitive to the Holy Spirit leading you. That's one of the most important things with uh, evangelism is listening to the inside, that inward witness, that that inward knowing, saying, okay, no more. <clears throat> end it on a good note. End it on a good note. Okay? Don't get into arguments with non-Christians about it. Okay? Just sort of say, okay, we'll, uh, we'll leave it. We'll leave it for now. If you ever want to talk to me about this subject, then that's fine. Okay. Well, God bless you. Thanks for joining me. Um, I know that the reading went beyond, I could have read this probably in five minutes, three minutes, but I really feel that that's what was in my heart that maybe God wanted me to share with you, uh, the, the, the subject of evangelism and stuff. So God bless you. Hope this has blessed you and please feel free to share, subscribe to my channel. In Jesus' mighty name, see you again in for chapter 11. God bless you. Bye-bye.